All right, we're here for today's lesson. Um, and before I start this lesson, I'm just going to say a prayer for us. This is a very important, mighty, and powerful lesson. Um, so I'm going to pray. Lord, I just thank you um, for your word. I thank you for what we know from your word, what we learn from your word, dear Lord. I thank you for your demonstration of your love for us um, and your willingness to go to the cross for us. I just pray for each person who listens to this lesson, dear Lord, that just they have a true and a deep understanding of your love for us. Just be with us as we go through it, dear Lord, and may it honor you. Okay, the trial is over, and the soldiers take Jesus, and he's half alive from weariness and pain and loss of blood, and in this state, they place this heavy wooden cross on his sore, beaten shoulders, and they told him to carry his own cross, which would be used to crucify him outside of the city gate and up a rocky path <clears throat> to the hill of Calvary. Well, the cross was very ha heavy, and Jesus was staggering under the weight, and the Roman soldiers saw this, and they looked around for help. And just then, there was a strong-looking man. Uh, scripture tells us he is Simon from Cyrene, a city in Africa, and he passes by. And they stop Simon, and they order him to carry the cross for Jesus. And, you know, don't you think that later that Simon was glad that he had the opportunity to help Jesus by carrying his cross to Calvary? And we've got to think, you know, would we voluntarily take up a cross and carry it for Jesus' sake. Of course, it wouldn't be a heavy wooden cross like this, but it might be something unusually hard, something unpleasant that would cause pain or suffering, something that we might have to sacrifice. Okay, It might even mean us putting away and no longer having something that we want or want to do very much. Okay, It might simply mean we can't have our own way with something. Okay, Cross always means suffering and death. It's not something pretty, easy, and pleasant. Well, a great crowd of people had followed Jesus through the streets and up the hill. And the Hebrew name for this hill was Galgotha, which means the place of the skull. And for hundreds of years, the worst criminals had been put to death by a very horrible torture of crucifixion. And the crowd had Roman soldiers and chief priests and just a throng of people who hated Jesus. And along with them, there were probably people in the crowd who were just curious and wanted to see an execution, as gruesome as that may be. And there were people shouting away with him, crucify him. Well, there were some in the crowd who loved him very much. The women that had been part of his life, the disciples, others for whom he had done so much. And they wept and they wrung their hands and they were crying because y'all think there was nothing they could do to help. There was no way to help him. They were just there. They knew he was going to be killed. And their hearts were filled with grief. Well, scripture tells us about nine o'clock in the morning, the soldiers placed him on a cross between two thieves. And through all of the agonizing pain, there was no complaint from Jesus, no curses, only a whisper. As he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Well, the two thieves crucified <clears throat> on either side of Jesus were criminals who, as robbers and murderers, they had led a rebellion against the government. Well, one thief was hanging on a cross to the right of him and the other to his left. And in their pain and suffering... They also cursed Jesus, and they cried above the noise of the crowd. You know, if you're the Son of God, if you're the Messiah, then get us down off this cross. Can't you get us out of this awful agony that we're going through? So the crowd jeered at Jesus as they walked by, and they shook their heads in mockery. And the chief priest and religious leaders stood around, and they made fun of him. And they said, ha, look at you now. Okay, If you're so wonderful and mighty, won't you save yourself? You saved all these other people. You performed all these other miracles. How about you just get down off that cross? Maybe then we'd believe in you. Well, the Roman soldiers were hurling insults, and they're rolling dice, and they're gambling for his coat. Well, the loved ones of Jesus could hardly bear all of this awful sight. There's tears running down their cheeks. They hid their eyes. They buried their faces. And many of the people whom he had healed and taught 
were probably there watching with very sorrowful hearts. Well, one of the thieves called over to the other one. He says, you know, we ought to be ashamed talking to Jesus the way we have been. He's God's son. He's the Messiah. Didn't you hear him praying for his enemies just a minute ago? You know, we deserve to die for our evil deeds, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Well, the thief who realized this looked at Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So what did he mean? Well, he was asking the Savior, you know, is, is it too late for me? Is it too late for me to be saved? Am I too bad? Can you even help me? And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And today you will be with me in paradise. It was not too late for that dying thief. He was not too bad to go to heaven. Nobody's too bad. Nobody's too sinful. Nobody's too wicked. Anyone, no matter who he is, can trust Christ as Savior. They can be cleansed and they can be made ready for heaven. Well, the two thieves were both sinners. They had both committed terrible crimes. At first, they had both cursed and blasphemed Jesus. But then... That one thief believed on him as Savior, and he got to go to heaven. Well, the other thief didn't believe on Jesus, and he didn't get to go to heaven. And these two people kind of represent everybody in the world, because some believe Jesus and get to go to heaven, and some do not, and they don't get to go to heaven. So how do you believe? Well, standing near the cross were three women, all of them named Mary. One was his earthly mother. One was his aunt, the wife of Cleopas, and there was Mary Magdalene. And they were weeping. And John, Jesus's beloved disciple, was standing beside the women. And Jesus said to Mary, he, talking about John, is your son. And then to John, he looked and said, she is your mother. And from then on, John took Mary into his home, took care of her and treated her as his own mother. So here Jesus is going through all of this pain, all of this agony, and he wants to be sure that his mother's taken care of. So as the day goes on, it's noon. And though it was noon, the sun was hot and bright, but suddenly a thick, eerie darkness fell, fell across the land. The light from the sun was completely gone. And scripture tells us that, ground, that the ground shook with earthquake tremors and rocks split apart and thunder roared and lightning flashed across the sky. And this dense, deep, dark blackness lasted for three hours. It lasted till three o'clock in the afternoon. Well, during this time, Jesus was in great pain and agony and his intense suffering. Um, and he cried out, I thirst. Well, someone ran and they filled a sponge with vinegar, put it on a stick, and they held it up to his lips for him to drink. Well, although the torture of the crucifixion is indescribable, the time of his greatest suffering was when God laid all of our sins on him. Here he was, the sinless son of God, and he became sin for us. God poured out his wrath and his hatred of sin and his punishment for sin onto his own precious son. And when God did this, the bystanders heard Christ, Jesus's voice ringing out through the darkness with a heart rending cries. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? And truly God, the father for a moment turned his back. On his son because Jesus had on him the awful weight of the sins of all mankind and Jesus for a time was cut off from his father's presence and he took eternal punishment in our place since God can't look on sin he had to turn away from Jesus for this brief time he forsook his son so that he would never have to forsake you and me. At three o'clock in the afternoon, 
And Jesus shouts, It is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He bowed his head and he died. This was not a weak, soft cry of a dying man. But when Jesus said this, it was a shout, a shout of victory, a shout of triumph. Because by suffering and death, he had won victory over sin and death and hell and Satan. He had done what he had come to do. He opened the way into heaven for all who believe on him. At the same time, the same time this happens, the heavy veil in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was split apart from the top to the bottom. And this was God's way of telling the people and the world that the sacrifices that had been offered through the centuries at the temple were no longer necessary because Jesus had sacrificed himself on Calvary's cross, thus making it possible for all people to come to God through faith in Jesus as the only Savior. Well, when the centurion, the Roman captain who's in charge of the crucifixion, saw all that had happened, he was convinced that Jesus wasn't just a man. And he cried out, surely this was the Son of God, and we didn't even know it. And he was right. Jesus, the Savior, is God the Son who died that awful day to take the punishment for our sins. And because he's God, he didn't remain dead. In three days, he came back to life. How we should thank him for all that he's done for us. If you've never accepted him as your personal Savior, why not do it now? Tell him that you know you're a sinner and that you believe that Jesus is God and that he died at Calvary to take the punishment of your sin and that you want him to come into your heart and save you. In our next lesson, we'll talk about that fabulous resurrection.